Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. I think uh, we're kind of right now, I feel, in a generation of um, you know replication rather than uh, you know, seeking and exploring musically because so many of the musicians coming up now seem to be, uh, it's too easy to just try to copy stuff directly off of like a YouTube video or something like that, rather than more of discover it yourself just off the record and figure it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's not the, it's not the same thing anymore. You know, you, you learn to play parts off another record that was, uh, you're building, you're getting your chops from that. And then you would start discovering, you know, your own self expression as a player and uh you know bringing all those tools together um but you know uh, to me it's uh you know they're out there the there's those musicians that you know uh you know, that are, are finding their way somehow through all this but uh but again you know the in the mainstream world you know they're they're having to adhere to such you know formulaic kind of kind of music and sound and sounding records that it's it's uh, difficult to pick that out sometimes. Yeah. What about for yourself when you're laying down parts? You know, how much of a perfectionist do you feel you are uh, being real with yourself, and uh, uh, how much are you sort of like a first take kind of guy? You know. Yeah, it it it, it depends on the artist. A lot of times, if I'm if I'm playing piano, uh, especially these days where you phone in your part, I'll I'll kind of dig in kind of deep. You know, I'll, I'll do some passes, but I, I'll usually end up comping something together of, of my parts and tweaking things to really just get the right voice leading and transitions to parts that uh, that might not on, you know, on a few passes might not quite get. So it's really, um, you know, on, on piano, I feel like I'm really arranging within it that way. And it's some things just call for just total feel. You know, I, I kind of take a listen to something that's... Uh, you know, get a sense of what the music is kind of asking for and go from there. Uh, and, uh, you know, a little bit of both sometimes in, in that respect. But, uh, but I'll, I'll get I'll get down and really, uh, you know, going with the microscope at times. Um, but a lot of things, the most feel things, you know, with, with uh, pads, atmospheres, those kinds of things, those are such feel things. Just find a sound that really just works beautifully in the song. And then, uh, and just kind of let it go and let it be what it is. But uh, you know, arrange specific parts. I, I will, I will take more time with and and uh, you know tweak them. I, I do a lot of uh, you know string arranging where uh, I need to go in and really come up with parts that are like like written arrangements. So that really takes a whole other uh, mindset. You know, coming up with what string lines wants to be, but also the, the the right and proper orchestration for them so it's uh, uh it's it's much more thought out in, in that respect because when you're doing virtual string arrangements and or mocking up something to eventually have live strings do it you really got to pay attention to to real proper string writing you know for the instruments that you're writing for or whatever that you could have to brass brass or any other uh, acoustic instruments that in those those kinds of cases are there any famous or well-known recordings that you've been part of where uh, you did something on it that you feel was a mistake that was left in there and you're like, oh, you know, but it actually works, you know, and, and people are like, don't worry about it, Jeff. 
It's good. You know, I mean, I, I have done some accidental things, but I, you know, it's a, it's funny. It's, it's sort of become part of a, a record. Uh, things with Russ Teitelman. Oh, probably uh, uh, hmm. Jenny Mole there. I did some things where I used, actually I used some samples <laughs> and some other sounds sounds and things like that that it was just kind of fooling around with some things they go, oh that's cool what is that you know just like oh just leave it so actually with cindy lauper there were probably a few moments where it was some accidental uh moments here and there but uh it's become such the fabric of of what the record is it was like kind of meant to be um, I'm going to definitely try to hit on all of the R&B funk related things that you were part of because the viewership is, you know, sure. big on that. Um, sure. But that know. was always in the funk world. That that was, again, I felt like such a, uh, you know, it was a special place in my heart musically as a player that uh, once I was doing rock and pop, it was always great to go back to it with with any of those bands to uh, to get to what would have been, you know, in a way, my roots, my musical roots. Well, the big one is going back and around 1990, working with Maceo and Bootsy on their records uh, with Bill yeah. Laswell. Mm -hmm. um, how did those yeah. projects happen? Those were those were similar in that they already had tracks down, and Bill had me in to basically do the sweetening on them with with the synths. So uh, there was there was usually there was always a basic down uh, with Bootsy. At the there was there was at least drums, bass. And, and a vocal. And then at that time, they was always using probably some Fairlight just to get some, some sound and textures to kind of set up the attitude for where a track might be going. And then, uh, you know, occasionally if, if Bernie was already in playing, uh, playing keys on it. Uh, but then it was, uh, again, about, about the, uh, you know, just adding color and textures and, uh, you know, orchestrating some, some parts. Bootsy did quite a bit of work with Laswell. Did you ever get to meet him? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, in fact, working on any of the Bootsy tracks, Bootsy was always there. So yeah. that, was, uh, that, was a, that was a blast. I mean, uh, again, such a, uh, such a personality. But, again, it's one of those kind of things, the kind of people you want to be in the room with and you want to just bring your, your A game to what they're doing because it's such joy in, in, in making the music. What would you say is principally different from playing rock parts to playing funk parts? I mean, is it uh, just the attitude mostly? Yeah, I'd say so. And, you know, again, the pocket, the pocket's going to be approached a bit differently. And it's all around where the, where the drummer is sitting for me. That's, that's, always, that's always what sets that apart. And now I always, I would say in, in funk, there's, there's a precision and a kind of a swing in that pocket that is, that world, you know, it's, it's really kind of thing. You hear it and feel it. And then moving into the rock world, uh, especially like saying, like, listen to like a, like Tony Thompson playing drums. There was always a thing where like his, uh, like his, his foot always felt maybe it was almost behind the beat, but wasn't. So you'd have to like land in on the downbeat, but then the snare was right on top of it, like a slap in the face, you know? So you, you had, it was almost that, that, boom, boom. So this real, again, it's a very visceral thing, kind of, you know, really got to kind of feel it in your body. And uh, the, the drummers to me was always the guide to, to any of that, you know, especially, you know, obviously with funk too, that was really the, uh, where that pocket laid, totally informed how I would, you know, in terms of keyboard comping, you know, if I was doing synth bass, that would, uh, you know, that would be my guide right there. Uh, you know, locking in with that, then everything else just locks together. Yeah. So just so everyone knows, those specific records uh, with Maceo and Bootsy were Let Him Out um, with Maceo, which was a uh, plea to get James Brown out of jail at the time. <laughs> right. right. And, uh, um, and Bootsy was uh, Jungle, jungle Bass. Yeah. Jungle Bass, yeah. 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 Um, it's funny, Jeff. Actually, I was doing a um, record review show uh, back then, uh, it was like at the movies, but for albums. And I uh, did Jungle Bass on that show and ran the video and everything. I just remembered that right at that time. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a blast. You know, you can't 
you know, you can't get enough funk, you know, any time in my life when I I get an opportunity to hear some serious funk, there's just nothing, nothing like it. Yeah, and right around the same period, you were also on the material record that had a lot of XP funk, Parliament Funk Delk guys on it. Yeah, yeah. Again, I felt like I was I was living in that universe around that time. So that was uh, what was so much fun about working on those those records. I don't um, know if you remember. I'll, t- I'll test your memory. Uh, but on that particular al- uh, album, did you get to work on the remake of Cosmic Slop they did? I don't recall those details. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but for Funketeers, that was very cool that uh, Bill Lassell was keeping the Funky Duck spirit going as it was. Oh, started, totally. You know. Um, and you also were credited with Shaka Khan. Do you remember that project? Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, I think, um, yeah, Wayne Brathwaite was producing. And again, that was one of the things I just worked, I worked directly with Wayne. And uh, I think Barry Eastman may have also been involved uh, as a producer. They were doing some co-production together. So again, uh, that was in as a session player. That's the thing. A lot of those things as a session player. So uh, it's really come in, do your thing, and then you're out. So a lot of times it's it's in that moment, not spending that much time sort of in the trenches with the artist uh, necessarily. So uh, a lot of those sort of things, especially those, you know, reminiscing about how it was working with certain artists, the ones that were present in the studio, like a Bootsy or something like that. You know, those are really memorable. Uh, and some of the cases where you really, uh, you know, working just with the producer that you work with a lot, it's, uh, you know, you don't get quite the same connection, you know, with the artist or the project, same way for myself anyway, speaking for myself. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, when, Bootsy was around. Did he actually play bass, or he was just hanging around and, and you know, given the the vibe? He was mainly hanging and giving the vibe. But part of giving the vibe would be to grab the bass and then say, "Here, check this out. Can you do this this kind of thing?" And he would play. He would play it on bass. So that that's how he you know would communicate the uh, you know certain you know certain ideas there, or uh, uh, you know, or 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 Bill would kind of you know be uh be an interpreter and kind of come up with yeah you know i think i think what bootsy's wanting to go and, and kind of direct me that way too so uh, but it's really again a lot of it is, is again about the vibe even uh you know like iggy pop with bill same thing you know iggy was around and was really like you know he was just he was just present there and uh but it was really build you know drive it driving the uh uh the ship you know and uh and just getting, uh, you know, just getting feedback or, uh, you know, sign off from, from Iggy, those kinds of things. But, you know, th- that's where, you know, you see the artist really trusting the producer to, to bring it the way they need it. Going back to that click that we just talked about, a project that uh, I think was grossly overlooked was Nickelback. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a kick-ass hard rock album right there. Oh, man. I mean... I mean that that's one of those records you said that sh- that should have received you know so much more uh, attention like that you know, and mixing with mixing that yeah uh, just that core rock and roll and the the the, the R and B funk roots yeah yeah I remember seeing a spotlight performance of theirs at the Key Club in Hollywood and going backstage afterwards and Keith Richards was back there and. All that. Oh yeah, that was yeah. really fun, you know. Yeah, yeah, because players like that really they you appreciate players who are like bringing that kind of that kind of thing, that kind of you know, cool, really interesting blend of of, of music together with that kind of attitude and and you know, uh, you know it, it's it's uh, you know it's it's rare, you know, and when you hear something special like that, you know, it attracts a lot of lot of attention. Was that another one kind of like you know? Uh, that the distance that you were like, hey, what happened? Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. yeah. First time hearing the whole album was like, oh, this is this. You can't avoid this. You know, this is one of those albums that I think uh, is going to get um, a lot of attention or a lot of. Tour. I mean, they did tour a bit. I don't know how much, how extensively they toured on that album. I know they were doing they were doing gigs, but I don't know, you know, where that 
how far that went, really. And, uh, you know, talk about two sides to a coin. You also won a Grammy the same year that came out for Celine Dion. Right, right. There I'm jumping between rock and roll and, and pop. But, um, yeah, and that was, that was through working with Jim Steinman. So I had the, the mega rock ballad operatic uh, hugeness of, of uh, what, what Jim did and then coming into the uh, Celine Dion world and, and introducing that into, into her, into her world there. And uh, that was where it was really, really a lot of, a lot of fun to, like, to bring the things that were really core to what Jim Steinman's music, that, the over the top bigness of it all and, uh, and bring that to Celine which, uh, you know, she wasn't really known for that kind of, that type of huge, you know, chest beating ballad, but, um, but there was an extraordinary performance she did on that. And was a Grammy something that really thrilled you or you, you like, you know, into awards or how do you feel about it? Oh, no, no, that was great. I mean, that, that was really, because uh, how that came about, how they became a producer on the album was we'd cut a couple of tracks with Jim. It's all coming back to me now. And, uh, uh, Oh, uh, river deep mountain high. And, uh, so we, we, we cut those two tracks with, with Jim producing. And, uh, they asked for, they asked for uh, him to do one more song on the album, produce one more song. Uh, and it didn't really have something that really, he felt would or they felt would work but they did come up with a song uh written by andy hill called call the man and uh jim just doesn't produce other people's songs he produces his own tracks so they they begged him to do it but uh they said well the only way he's going to really want to work on it is that if he brought me in to, to produce the actual track for it uh so i i that that was my opportunity to come on the record as a producer and so I, uh, I, I produced the track, Jim Executive produced, and uh, uh, that, that was my entry into an album and won a Grammy on the first shot out on a, on a big major record as a producer. <laughs> so so that, was, that, was, that was brilliant in and of itself. You know, did, you go, was, did, you, uh, did you go to the event? Oh, yeah, yeah. Got on stage with all the producers. There were seven or eight producers on the album as well, because uh, on that particular album, a lot of the songwriters... Uh, produce their own tracks so uh so there were uh there was a there was a bunch of us there including you know david foster who'd been with her for quite a while at that particular point um so yeah i got got to be on stage and uh be part of that which is uh, wonderful yeah what was your dad's when did your is your dad's uh still around or is he deceased yeah my dad's still still here he's he's 94 and still oh wow god still bless rocking. yeah yeah he, he doesn't play anymore he, he probably hasn't played for five or six years but up to like his late 80s uh he was still still able to play with a reasonable amount of energy he would you know do uh uh you know some you know brass quintet that kind of thing but it was just getting a little bit much for his chops uh later on so uh but uh, he, he he was he played for many years after he even retired, just doing uh, you know some solo work here and there, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Oh, you you must have been making him proud, though. Oh yeah, yeah. No, he loved it. He loved it. It was a really different world than than his too, because he's as a trumpet player and and orchestra, big bands and that kind of thing. Uh, that kind of side man job, different than being like, again, the keyboard player in a rock and roll band and, <laughs> and a whole different feel. And being part of a band, I, it was it was tough for him a couple of times when I was talking about, well, maybe I'm not going to go to music school. I'll just, I got to play in a band, become a rock and roll star or something like that. And it was really, it was, it's really tough. But, you know, I went to school. I'm so glad I did. And, uh, you know, that, that part, that was, you know, kind of what he gifted me to really, you know, do my, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, have that education and background uh, along with the, uh, uh, just the feel of, of, you know, rock and roll and funk and all, all that. You know, pop music. Yeah. Um, you ever find yourself in the studio with uh, folks that don't have that kind of, you know, academic training? They're just sort of, you know, self-taught yeah. or whatever, and do you ever get a little frustrated sometimes? 
It can be. It, it can be. Um, I found it, well, I would say uh, of late with with sort of your do-it-yourself, uh, do indie artists that have sort of, you know, came to love music, got an acoustic guitar, learned how to play, wrote songs, and then don't really have that much of a foundation otherwise. And sometimes, you know, somebody's really got it. See, that's the thing. There's that line where somebody who's really has it, has got the talent and this, this innate sense of, of music, uh, they get it and they hear it. Um, when you get in the situations, that middle ground where uh, they don't have the skill set to either use it to, to, uh, to learn and build upon their, their musical knowledge and all that, that can be, that can be pretty frustrating. Yeah. And, you know, the generational thing, too. I mean, you know, my references, you know, you're saying to somebody, yeah, like, a, you know, this thing like, a, you know, Chaka Khan song, you know, which would be like Chaka Who, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, it's uh, 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 and you know, it's a lot of different references you know, get. So it, 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 it pays. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot from them just to see what, uh, you know, driving their boat, what's what brought them into, uh, you know, wanting to do music and all that. Uh, so I was trying to keep a, yeah, trying to keep it just very, as open as possible. Yeah. Kind of in, the, in a similar vein, Jeff, I was just talking uh, yesterday and um, an open, a band, a, a hit uh, group that was supposed to open for uh, Lenny Kravitz um, didn't want to rehearse, you know? And so, they were against rehearsing and Lenny booted them off the tour, you know? So that's sort of like part of that generational thing that you're talking about, I think. Yeah. I mean, geez, rehearsal is the, is the secret. <laughs> it's the secret sauce to getting on stage and then really being able to just bring it all the way under. Yeah. Now, I mean, I mean, if you're just jamming, it's one thing and you've got excellent musicians, I could see, you know, use, using the venue to, be the place to make that happen but but yeah you know opening up for lenny kravitz bringing something that's really like you know just you know you know yeah wow wow um i you know I, so I, I don't know if these were just you know sort of you know hit it and move on type things but i'll i'll mention other ones i i mark were the bgs okay yeah that was loads of fun and again working with just a, a, an amazing legendary band yeah and watching them in the room work together and they would uh uh you know lay down a basic track i mean they were so totally into programming and synths and all that it was just like part of the the language in the studio and then to watch the three of them get together up on the mics and lay down a reference reference a harmony the three of them singing a song together i mean that was just you know just to witness that and that was 97. They, they had been doing that for like 40 years or whatever at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. And there was, you know, they, to her, they were full there, you know? I mean, it was just amazing. You know, those, those are those, you know, few legendary artists that, that continue just carrying, you know, bring it, bringing it all the way. Yeah. A lot of session work. You, you do a lot of that. And, uh, you know, you're re responding and bringing your, your A game to, to whatever the music is that you're, that you're presented with and, uh, and then move on to the next thing. Is that, was that the case for Iron Maiden? No, that was, that was, you know, just blood and guts as far as working with that. Even though, you know, I work remotely, um, you know, I would get a, a basic track for, for some of the earlier pieces like Blood Brothers back, that was like, 2000 2002 somewhere around there um would, i would get the track and would just get you know the, like notes as to what what lines to chase what lines to double in terms of guitars because it was so riff oriented and then i'd uh i'd work i'd orchestrate it up and then if there were places they were hearing other things then i would go dig in and do do what i thought was you know within my own ranging sense what would work the best there uh, but that that's fun. And again, that brings me back to my Jim Steinman world of going into epic, killer rock and roll, you know, don't hold back and just and just br bring it all. And, uh, uh, 
Yeah, the last album I worked on was uh, yes, it was the one eight, 18 minute song. Yeah, it was the the Book of Souls. The main song I worked on was Empire of the Clouds. The uh, they they said the process for that's really was really interesting. Uh, they were in Paris recording, and they edited together a piano part uh, for the that blocked out the eighteen minute piece of music. So uh, what they did was they sent me the piano part. And I needed to create a click track to this live piano part so that the band could play to it. And also that I had a click track for reference for doing the string and orchestra arrangements on top of it. So generated a click track for the band to play to, to this was live piano, but all edits. So there's no real, real straight click through the song. Sent it back to them. The band played on it, got their whole structure built out on the 18 minutes with vocals. And then they sent back the 18 minutes to me, then to orchestrate, because it goes through all these different sections, and there's a whole story involved in the 18 minutes. And then at that point, then I had the foundation to be able to uh, program all the string parts. So it's all it's all virtual. And if you if you listen to the uh, to the track, um, you know here you know it begins in you know very small like chamber group, and then it moves to the big epic rock and roll, you know big low basses and cellos, and uh, and, you know, the heroic French horns where they need them in the story. And it's, it's great. It's like opera, you know, to me. Yeah. Yeah. It must have been a kick to hear the finished product after, you know, taking it through those steps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of times it's, it's you know, you see what goes on behind the scenes to make a track, you know, what it was. You know, because for 18 minute piece of music to be able to one you know how how, how is the band going to execute that live in terms of in the, you know, whether it's just cutting it in the studio and really keeping the energy and and working out an arrangement like that where uh you know it was a lot of detail and by the time you learn the whole 18 minute session try doing take straight through that's uh that's crazy so you you got to learn it you know in each sort of like chapter that the piece goes through and uh, you know, so that building process, what what gives you the you know the total experience? And that's another band with incredible longevity, Iron Maiden. Yeah, yeah. So I, I love working on projects like that. You know, those are uh, you know, it's it's an adventure musically. I get to, uh, especially with my rock and roll roots, go go back to those and get to to bring that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you've been working of late with Joe Bonamassa, who, uh, you know, yes. is one of the blues guitar players. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's been awesome fun. And, uh, yeah, I've been actually doing uh, string arrangements, uh, orchestra arrangements on his, his thing since the early 2000s as well, when he's, when he's needed strings on tracks. So that, that, that's, been, that's been a lot of fun as well. Because it's got, uh, you know, it got the bl the blues rock thing. Because again, you know, it goes back to my roots, playing in, in the in rock band. So uh, for me, it's like getting back and letting part of that part of myself shine there. And, how, did you, uh, how, how did you connect with him, though? Um, that's actually through Kevin Shirley, his producer. Because Kevin also produced the uh, Iron Maiden. Oh. So uh, so in a lot of ways, it's it's through Kevin. You know, having me, uh, you know, having me as uh, a ranger on on those tracks. So I've uh, worked on a number of Kevin's uh, projects, including I think like Jimmy Barnes, the Australian uh, singer, is also a great rocker. Worked on a couple of Jimmy Barnes albums. Yeah, Bonamass is virtuoso as as far as I'm concerned, but also he's so oh, prolific. Yeah. He's very prolific. I mean, he just does a lot oh, of yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you go through the, you know, live at Vienna, there's live at Carnegie Hall, and the range that he does, each concert's got its own really special concept. Um, and when he did Carnegie Hall, if, if for any, any uh, listeners out there or viewers of the podcast, go, go check those out because you're going to see some, some playing going on there uh, that is just astounding. Just astounding. Oh, yeah. I highly recommend Joe Bonamassa. And, uh, he just uh, produced one of my favorite guitar players of today, Eric Gales. So, yeah. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Something yeah. maybe that just uh, happened in the studio that you recall, like uh, a power failure or 
uh, you know, somebody coming in, uh, you know, uh, you know, stoned out of their mind and, and couldn't do things or whatever. Oh, know? well, I could tell some stories. <laughs> Oh boy. I mean, some things I couldn't, I couldn't talk about. I couldn't talk about because the, the artists are still, still with us. Um, but there's be- definitely been some adventures. There's been some adventures. Uh, uh, I would say more crazy stories during the eighties when there was a lot of, uh, I'll say it's just a lot of drug use and all kinds of things going on antics that would, uh, that would, that would happen there. But, um, uh, but another, I think a really rewarding project to work on would be Michael Jackson. Talk about in terms of groove and, and on the funk side of things is I worked on the history album. And that was really interesting. Um, uh, you know, to have, again, sort of being you know, put in a room and said, do your thing. And he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be in the room with you, you know, directing you when you, when you worked. It was really like, do what you do kind of looking for several things, as an engineer might say, you're looking for these types of things and lay it all down. And then Michael will review later and, you know, choose what he, what he wants. And it was, it was great because you weren't intimidated. You could also just bring, bring your A game to it. And uh, he, he could choose what he, what he uh, liked and mix and match, uh, you know, different players, parts and things like that. And, uh, you know, to me, hearing the tracks at, uh, you know, in process, work in progress um, level was really, really interesting in terms of, you know, especially when we're talking grooves and the pocket, you know, a lot of things where he would lay down an original vocal scat part that would be the rhythm. And sometimes they would use that as reference when he would lay his ideas down and then you would, he would play it, he would play it for you. Say, okay, this is kind of Michael's idea here, you know, and it might be like that. He said, this is kind of the feel he's looking for there. So he said, okay, cool, cool. I'll, uh, you know, keep that in mind and kind of work that vibe. And uh, that's where if you go back through any songs that, you know, have any of those kind of vocal, those rhythmic vocalizations, a lot of times that, that as I understood it, were uh, like a scratch ideas, but they were so cool that they, they kept them in the records. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Did you get to meet him at all? Yeah, yeah. But it was usually he was coming. He was he was coming in after. Uh, I always like would work a window. A lot of any of the players were working. I would work a window before he came in, and then it, uh, at that point, that's when you left left your parts up. Everybody was recorded, ready to go, and then you would just you know say hello and then be on your way. And then he would he would do his review and and work you know, for the, for the evening at that point. So usually found myself, you know, come in at like, you know, say 10 in the morning work, uh, you know, maybe work a six hour session or something like that. And then uh, he might've been working at another studio doing vocals and then will come over uh, later when they knew he was like, we were like ready, ready for him. Uh, then, you know, they would get the call and uh, say, okay, Mike, Michael's, you know, Michael's ready, you know, when you're all done, just let us know. And then uh, just very, everything's just well coordinated and all that. And then that, that was it. And then wait till the record comes out to, to hear, hear what parts uh, were, were included or not, you know, and that, that was, uh, you know, ha- happily surprised in a bunch of different, different things I played on, you know, uh, would, uh, would be part of it. There's a lot of amazing players playing on these tracks. <laughs> yeah. Was uh, Greg filling games and guys like that around, or was he still part of it? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at that particular point, again, I was in the studio, and there's a few different session players, uh, West Coast, East Coast, that we'd come in and be working on existing tracks that were already uh, cut and, and laid out already. So it was really about, you know, f- you know, f- filling the blanks, bringing, bringing uh, new, new overdubs to, like, you know, the, the songs as they were already written and laid out. Like who, that. Had, who had production credit on that one? Was, was it still Quincy or somebody else? Uh, no, it would, it would have been Michael and uh, Bruce Swedeen at that point. Yeah, yeah. Now, I worked with Greg on Eric Clapton uh, album, which was also that was a uh, great album. That was in '89. Uh, also with uh, Nathan East. Well, yeah, Nathan East, uh, Jim Keltner, 
play drums. Yeah, great band. And Russ Tidelman, yeah, uh, produced that. Uh, yeah, that was, oh, Journeyman. Yeah, that was 1989. And that was a that was a that was an amazing record to play on. You know, start getting into those. Those were kind of records where the best of the best were playing on them. So, got to you know play on a track with like Jim Keltner, and then go on another track and play with uh, Steve Ferrone. You know, it was just just amazing. Yeah, hmm. and working with Russ Tidelman, another was just an amazing producer. That was the opportunity to play with so many great players, uh, including doing a Michael McDonald album that didn't get a lot of traction, but was uh, was was brilliant there. Um, oh, I got to uh, ask you, what was it like um, working with Yoko Ono? Oh, it was a lot of fun. She was great. She was awesome. She was really sweet and very. Uh, uh, how can I just say? It? You know, she was, you know, grateful that you came to work on her stuff and was, you know, uh, so gracious and, and nice. You know, I couldn't have been, you know, you, you came in with like, well, what's this going to be like? It's going to be some crazy, freaky stuff. You know, what is up, you know, up with that? But came in and treated, you know, you know, it was so professional and just very sweet. And this was, again, with, with Bill at the driver on the driver's seat there, you know, this, the session runs, you know, in Bill Laswell mode. But with, with the art, artist present, you know, with that always was a different dynamic with Bill, but you know, she, she was again just, uh, you know, she really def defers to her producer and lets it be known, you know, like whether it's something she really likes or if it's, you know, true to what she's trying to say or express. So uh, I, I enjoyed it. It was great. Ch change any preconception about who or what I thought she was. And then you can take it also to, uh, you know, the Get Back documentary where, you know, she doesn't come across as whatever, you know, stories that people spoke about how she was around then and goes, yeah, you know, it was, the, the presence was a totally different impression of her around the creative process than I had imagined. Isn't that funny? It, was, it's, it, it reminds me of like, you know, when people will tell you a teacher was horrible in school and then you get the teacher like, I like this person, you know? Yeah. 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 I don't know what happened with, with you, but I really enjoyed, you know, working with them. Yeah. Yeah. Was there anyone that you can talk about that you kind of clashed with a little creatively in the studio or maybe was a little, um, you know, just um, petulant or I don't know? Oh, you know, I, I, I couldn't really. I mean, honestly, I can say that, you know, it's it's happened very rarely. And uh, what I found for myself by uh, in most cases, just understanding that this is a creative person. And that their way to communicate may not be in the most friendly or, uh, let's say, easy way or flowing way to communicate their ideas and, and try to find a way to work around that. Yeah, because like I said I, I would, anyone I would speak about is, is still here. And, and, but, you know, I respect, I respect them <laughs> and and really you know and you know no matter what personality you know might have been uh challenging uh you know at the end of the day you know there was a, a good record was made you know so it, it, despite despite their attempts maybe to, <laughs> to uh, you know get in your way doing it <laughs> despite the scar over here and <laughs> oh yeah 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 i I've had a couple of situations where I think I, I think it would help me, you know, decide to go into therapy at, at one point. But again, like I said, I, with all, uh, you know, uh, you know, respect to the to the artists, uh, would say it's uh, that's to say, you know, they're 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 there, uh, but you know, keeping it, you know, I had to keep it as professional as I could, you know, in those situations. What, yeah. what about anything that was uh, that happened that was funny that you remember that they wouldn't mind if you remember oh gee gee well there's so many good laughs it's hard to you know inside studio things are i i will tell you actually working with cindy locker we were doing uh, uh across the universe running across the universe and the engineer in the middle of a live take we were doing we were doing the taste live just captioned alive i was out in the live room 
uh, with Cindy. Jimmy Braylauer was in the, in the control room with his facing the rear of the console with his, machi his drum machine and outboard equipment. We laid the track down and we got to the end of the track and there was no engineer. We go, where's the engineer? Where'd he go? And it turns out he had been up all night the night before, came straight from wherever he came from into the studio, and he blacked out halfway through the tape. It was on the floor. So it called 911 and got, got him revived and everything like that. That was, that was the end of the session for the day. But uh, that, that was one of those crazy moments where we did this. We were just in this zone across the universe, got to the end. We closed, we opened our eyes, and we're gone. And so he went, you know, hey, can you play Can you play that back? And we're going, what? And then we looked, and then uh, Jimmy Braylauer was in the control, and he's gone, too, because he'd gone around the console, was down on the floor trying to get him and called an assistant in. And uh, we had, we had, uh, we lost our engineer. But uh, <laughs> that's uh, maybe yeah. the take. Maybe the take was just so, you know, breathtaking oh. he, fa he fainted you know oh totally totally it was a multi-dimensional uh, mm -hmm. multi-dimensional take that brought all galaxies and universes together in one and he just it was just too much yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great what about do you have uh, one or two uh memories from all of your time on the road that are just the most unforgettable aside from herbie hancock oh um geez. Oh, geez, you know, uh, playing with Jeffrey Osborne was great because I hadn't played with a male singer that has such a, a fan base. That uh, My father used to go on tour with uh, um, Engelbert Humperdinck, hmm. where the women were throwing the panties up on the stage and everything like that. You know, so he, he had his own day, you know playing the gigs where, you know, you know, bras and panties and every, everything were coming, coming up onto the stage. And uh, Jeffrey Osborne, he just, you know, there I, I kind of was my, my version of that, just in terms of just what he brought and uh, just the, uh, the reactive response of the audience, especially the women, you know, to, to him as, uh, as uh, you know, who he was. It was, it was good fun. But again, the, all these, these, Kind of player. I mean, he's kind of artist. You know, Jeffrey he, Osborne he, is a singer. He's actually one of my favorite male singers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. In fact, I. I yeah. It's been a while since I. Uh, I thought about that. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. yeah. What What year about was that? Do you think? That would have been. Eighty. Yeah. Oh, geez. Eighty five. Eighty six. So right in his of of peak. That's his peak right there. Yeah. 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 And you played, did you play some of the LTD stuff from the catalog too? Like yeah. Yeah. There were a couple on there. And all, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fun songs to play. That was probably a case where, you know, when I was doing playing at cover bands, playing like in a holiday and disco band, playing LED, LTD songs, and then being on the stage with the guy doing it. You know, yeah, back in love again. Yeah, right. <laughs> back in love again. Yeah, that was the, that was the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah great fun, but uh, very different playing with the artist than with the uh, uh, the uh, hotel lounge <laughs> band. <laughs> fewer, fewer panties on stage there. Uh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. Any okay. other ones besides Jeffrey Osborne? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Everything crazy. Although uh, opening with change, opening up for Rick James, those were those were classic. Um, playing on that circuit down south, there were a few things where some of the promoters were a little iffy. Mm. And uh, I think we were in Kentucky. We were loaded in, set up. Rick James had done his sound check, and we had we had just done our sound check. And a road manager came out to us. He said, grab your stuff. We're getting out of here. We go, what do you mean? He says, just grab your stuff. We're getting out of here. And the crew is pulling our gear off the stage. We get our clothes out of the dressing room, get out to our bus. And apparently, the uh, 
guess, I don't know whether it was a sheriff, state police, whether it came for the promoter. And they were, uh, they were going to lock the doors on the venue. So either he hadn't paid something, there was something going on there. So uh, there were arrangements made to get all the gear out, but the sound system got locked in the venue overnight. We had, we had some delays because the, the gear had to go to the next venue. So there were some there were some issues around that I remember, but having to like hightail it out of the event because a, a you know, shady promoter was uh, uh, having some issues there was was kind of crazy, especially when you're looking at a full on you know stadium level show like that. Yeah, yeah, that was sort of uh, endemic in a way with a lot of those uh, R and B uh, bills at that time. A lot of shady promoters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, just yesterday I was talking about uh, M. Tume uh, did a show like oh, that yeah. where the promoter skipped out and they said not getting paid, but they still went on and performed even knowing they were not going to get paid. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I guess that the audience did come there for you, you know, and got uh, got to do it sometimes. Jeff, if somebody asked you, you know, what are one or two signatures of your keyboard style? What might you say? Oh boy, you know the in my funk days, it would be the it would be the brass stabs and brassy synth lines were what I know. And again, that was my me bringing my trumpet player chops in into into that kind of a thing. You know, if you listen to some of the uh, the, the change records, some of the from the stabby brass and, and fills. Um, and then when you get to the rock world, then it's, uh, it was actually, well, take Robert Palmer. It would be, you know, again, bringing some of the funk into the Robert Palmer world, you know, the, cl the clavinet-ish, but synth-based, funky kind of kind of rhythm parts would be another, another trademark that you had. You can hear that, like uh, Discipline of Love. Uh, uh, that would be a good example on, on Rob Palmer there. Um, but I, I felt I was always like, a, uh, I was always sort of like a morphing myself a lot of times. So I was finding myself, you know, just adapting to a style and, and being lots of things where you can't say, oh, well, that's Jeff Bova playing. It was a time, especially in the funk world, where it was like, oh, that's Jeff Bova playing and it's gotta be him. But, but later on bringing, you know, stepping into the pop and rock world, it was really then it started becoming about, oh, you know, that, that sound sounds like something he would do. It would be a sound, might be a blend of these different instruments that would be, you know, massive, huge sound that kind of like filled the whole, the whole track up, but in a good way, <laughs> rather than eat, the, eat all the space up and have no, no air for anybody else. We find a way to give a bigness and expansiveness to the sound. You mentioned, uh, you know, people like... Uh, John Lord and Jan Hammer, and uh, um, we talked about Bernie and Herbie and those guys. Were there any keyboard players that came up in the 80s or 90s or even more recent that you're very impressed with or you're a fan of? Oh, yeah. I mean, so, so many different ones. I mean, I mean, part of my roots, I mean, just talking about being a piano player, I mean, Elton John, right from the jump, as, as what he is and what he does is just, you know, that's. Uh, you know that that's a, you know, a hero on that point. On the organ, you know, I was listening to, uh, you know, Keith Emerson, John Lord, especially. And I later actually at one point I had one of my one of my B3s, uh, uh, John Lord's organ tech, did the modifications that John Lord had to my B3, and it was the uh, the John Lord setup. That I could scare people out of the room. It was so unbelievably huge and big. I mean, it was really something. Uh, that 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 was that was that was a blast. Um, but you know, hearing how he used the B three in a guitar environment where it still had a presence, it wasn't lost. It's just oh, it's just the keyboards. It's just kind of padding, and filling. It was like a still a lead instrument and a really instrumental part of you know the uh, heavy heavy metal and heavy rock. Or, yeah, moving into the future there, boy, you know, Chick Corea, of course, um, from that whole jazz rock fusion there. That's when I was, uh, I guess, really building my chops 
and and learning keyboard players of it not into the into the pop world i mean keyboard based bands then you know human league was just just a loads of fun you know again you know they weren't necessarily technically uh really players but to me they really used the synths and synth pop just the way i thought was was really awesome you know a sense of programming and sounds that uh um yeah, that, that gets into the synthesis world, you know, craft work, uh, Vangelis, you know, yeah. Have you heard uh, anyone uh, that's come up more recently, though, that has cut your ear that wasn't around back uh, then? Yeah, I guess I would I would probably say, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, oh, geez. Uh, John Baptiste. I was going to say anybody right now, as far as just a keyboard player, that I really appreciate his chops and I appreciate uh, musicality. Soul and musicality. Yeah. 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 Which three tracks that you've been a part of are your favorite or the ones that you're most proud of? Okay. I would. Hmm. Okay. Uh, it's all coming back to me now. Roy Bitten is playing piano, so I have to give credit where credit is due. But all the synth, keyboards, and orchestration are, are myself. And to, to put something like that together, I'm really, really proud how that turned out. Um, addicted to Love, he is on that. That's uh, one of the first things you hear actually on the record are a, a Yamaha. Uh, uh, you know, DX7 sound that's doing this FM sweep at the very front on the album version. I think in the single, that extra little intro got cut out. Uh, but that track is, you know, it's un unstoppable there. Something from the last, well, Canon maybe, or? Yeah, yeah, I probably Seven Souls, I think. Yeah. The Western Lands, Seven Souls. Just, just proud of being a part of something that's so different, so left of center. You know, he could pl I could play on pop records for days, but uh, yes, yes, th those things, especially with uh, 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 with William S. Burroughs narrating, doing a spoken word on top of these groovy funk tracks. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Eclectic with a capital E. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, challenge your memory bank one last time. And that okay. is, we'll see where this goes. Hopefully, I like to ask guests, you know, to pick their five Desert Island albums. You know, if you can only have five to listen to for eternity, what would those okay. five, five be for you? And they can't be any that you're on. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, first, I would say it always comes to mind is it well in terms of albums or artists um you know what comes to mind in the strangest way is going to be like wichita alignment okay glenn, glenn, glenn campbell glenn campbell wichita alignment you know there's something about that it was maybe the time when i was a kid when i heard it that i could listen to that forever <laughs> And just be there with the telegraphing line. Da, 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 you know, I could I could listen to that forever. Um, Girl from Ipanema, Bossa Nova, I could just again listen, listen to you know any of the classics forever. Mahler's second symphony. Okay. It's so rock and roll that but yet the beauty and power of the second symphony. Um, I mean, check that out. It's, 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 it starts off with the cellos doing this big diff. If it was done on guitar, if he had guitars at the time, it would have been a thing, you know, it's just like that. And it's, it's, it's killer. Um, I think Prince was a fan of that too. Yeah. Yeah. Holler second. And, uh, and believe it or not, because it was one of my mom's favorites and really special place for me was, uh, uh, let's see, 
Sibelius Symphony Number no. Two. Just thematically, just gorgeous piece. The end of it just opens up, and it's like the heavens just break loose there. We're talking about really, you know, it's <laughs> just stuff coming from here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. It wouldn't be like any pop or rock and roll stuff, but it would be, you know, in that world, you know, Boss Nova, Joe Beam. Give me any Joe Beam, you know, that way if I'm on that desert island, just just cruising with with any anything. Yeah. So, so I think that's like four maybe that you named. So you Yeah, do we do four? Do we do four? And then the top it off, boy. Grace Jones. Oh, slave to the rhythm. Oh, yeah. 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 Pull up to the bumper on that one? Yeah. 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 What else is on that album? Well, it's really that song, really, because you go back to, uh, like, poor, you know, the Vion Rose. That's, uh, you know, so let's I kind of get into those individual tracks. My Jamaican guy. I mean, uh, just Grace Jones. You know, if I can bring Grace Jones with me, <laughs> 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 I'd be a happy camper. <laughs> So that's quite an eclectic bunch, Mahler and uh, Grace Jones. <laughs> yeah, well, that suits yeah. you based on, you know, going from Celine Dion to Iron Maiden and so forth. So, yeah, uh, yeah. What are you up to right now? And, uh, you know, how can people keep up with what you're up to? Yeah, well, you, you go to my website. It's bovaland.com. And uh, Bovaland was a place Jim Steinman used to call that I would go under headphones while I was programming songs for him, where I would be under headphones programming away. And then he would ask, hey, so what's happening? What do you got for me? And then I would turn up the volume and then play back what I was uh, working on. And all this stuff would happen. So he always said, you know, really cool things happen in Bovaland. So I, I adapted that for, for myself. So at Bovaland.com. And uh, you can, you know, see whatever I'm up to there and, and listen to some uh, some projects, you know, favorite projects over the years up there. And then some recent things, more recent things that are uh, that I've been working on with some like new, new artists uh, that I've been like either developing or worked with recently, you know, including Joe and uh, some, some indie artists that I think are very cool. And I'm, I'm producing some indie artists. I'm working with a Malaysian artist right now. We're so kind of an epic album where we've been doing it East meets West. She's, she's Malaysian now, American citizen. And we've got players from all over the world that we're collaborating with. Uh, you know, so it's been really, really a lot of fun. You know, the drummers, uh, 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 different kinds of you know, Asian string instrument players, instrumental players and all that. And, uh, you know, so that, that's been, that's been a blast. And I'm also working, it's, it's, uh, I uh, can't really say too much about it, except I'm working, composing music for a, uh, a company that's, uh, that's working with a, uh, best way I can say it is with a wellness device that's using music uh, in, in wellness or in a wellness use. So it's the best, best, uh, most I can really say about it at this particular point, but it's really fascinating to see what, what scientists are working on, putting science and music together, some really interesting ways. So hopefully in a year or two, it'll uh, it'll it'll show itself in the marketplace. That's the idea. Wow, you're onto some next level stuff. Sounds like yeah, yeah, it's fun. You know, next the next challenge. You know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, well it's cool. been so much fun talking to you, Jeff, and recounting oh, your great history. You know. Thank oh, you thank so you so much. Thank you so much for all the great music over the years. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. And I'm so glad it's connected with people and so grateful to be a part of so many, you know, wonderful projects and things that, you know, hopefully changed a person's life or brought something to somebody, uh, whether it was, you know, in that moment of need or happiness or joy or fun, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, 
submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying everything is on the one, the first guy to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkandstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkandstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.